the Economics of Compassion initiative is a robust effort to change the dynamics of a culture filled with inequality, especially economic inequality. ECI is based in Cincinnati and provokes new ways of thinking about poverty and economic health and provides resources that can have real impact in our neighborhoods. The Long Road to Neighborliness is a set of talks by thought leaders in the movement, including writer, consultant, and social activist Peter Block and renowned biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann. Their perspectives bring fresh light to the challenge. So we want to get down to uh, specifics tonight about my assignment, yet again, is to remind you of the narrative frame of reference uh, in which we are thinking and going to act so that uh, we uh, do not think that we have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, the narrative story is the story of departure from Pharaoh's Egypt and the departure from a predatory economy uh, to make a road to neighborliness happen. It is a very hard road and partly it's a hard road because we cannot see the route. So what the Exodus story in the Old Testament tells us is that Pharaoh's narrative of accumulation and monopoly has been interrupted. And uh, when it was interrupted, it took some negotiation, it took some uh, guerrilla warfare in the plagues, but then they left. They left Egypt, they departed the predatory economy, and what we're trying to think about is how do we together and how do we individually depart the predatory economy in ways that will put us more fully on the road to neighborliness. Leading the predatory economy means walking into the wilderness, and the wilderness is a place of without visible, viable life supports. Like everybody who leaves Pharaoh's world, they were terrified. And then you know how the story goes. What they discovered is that the wilderness that had no visible, viable life supports was indeed a place of abundance. It turned out that there were, was abundant bread, there was abundant water, and there was abundant quail. The lectionary reading this Sunday, one of the readings is from Numbers 11, where they ask for quail. And God gets so provoked with them, God says to them, these verses are left out, of course, but God says, you want quail? I'll give you quail for a day. I'll give you quail for a week. I'll give you quail for a month. I'll give you so much quail, I will stuff it up your nose. That, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. <laughs> so then they went to Sinai. And as you know, they got the commandments there. And I think that the commandments are rules and guidelines for how to administer the abundance. We know how to administer scarcity. You uh, arrange a pyramid so the money all flows to the top. That's how you administer scarcity. But what we're trying to think about is how do you administer abundance? And I will mention three rules for the administration of abundance. The first one is keep Sabbath. Because there is an abundance of time, only the predatory economy wants us to think that we don't have enough time. The second rule that Moses gave us is that at the end of every seven years, you got to cancel debts on poor people because we have an abundance of neighbors in need. And the third rule of abundance is the Jubilee year, which every 49 years, people are given back what they lost in the rough and tumble because there are enough resources. 
So that's a great triad. Sabbath, because there is enough time. Debt cancellation, because there are enough neighbors in need. And Jubilee, because we have enough resources. Now, you may know that the rules given at Mount Sinai were very lean. There were only 10. And they didn't go very far. So what I want to tell you about tonight that you probably don't know because you have not, not, not read the dreary book of Deuteronomy, which is the most, one of the most exciting books in world literature. The book Deuteronomy, the name Deuteronomy, has within it the word duo, duet, and it has been translated as a copy of the Torah. Copy, a second copy. But I think it's not a copy. I think it is a second version which advances beyond Sinai. So it is a revised version. It is a standard revised version. It is a new standard revised version. Because what Israel discovered is you got to keep opening the Torah to new obligations and new possibilities to take current. So there's a lot of stuff in the book of Deuteronomy that Israel didn't get at Sinai. And the reason I want to stress that dynamism is that I want to suggest to you that our work is to do the next standard revised version of Deuteronomy and now formulate the rules for abundance that are pertinent to our economic situation. But I want to tell you about some of those rules for abundance. What you can see in the Old Testament is that there is a, a split in Torah interpretation. One interpretation goes in the direction of purity. So they have all these rules about who's more pure than whom. And it turns out that males are more pure than females and whites are more pure than blacks and Jews are more pure than Gentiles. So it creates a hierarchical thing and the people who are more pure, white males, have more access to the goodies. That's how the economy works. I'm not recommending that. The alternative interpretive trajectory in the book of Deuteronomy is about what you have to do to create neighborliness. And I'll just mention a half a dozen of these. These are quite remarkable um, uh, Torah regulations that the Bible thumpers never cite because the Bible thumpers think there's nothing there but sex. So first, you shall not charge interest on loans to your neighbors. That's a very old conviction in the Jewish tradition and in the Christian tradition. Second, you shall not take collateral on a loan from a poor person. A poor person, so Moses says, has only one coat. And you can take a coat for a loan, but when it gets cold at night, they're going to need to sleep in it, so you have to take it back to their house and let them sleep in it. Then you can pick it up again in the next morning for collateral on the loan until sundown and then you have can you imagine doing that on a 30-year loan I, I think Moses intended to make it so uh, inconvenient you just said to hell with the collateral the third rule of Moses in Deuteronomy 24 uh, it says you shall not withhold payment that is earned by a hireling. You shall not engage in wage theft, but you shall pay the hireling on the day the money is earned. I, I go around and talk and once in a while I get paid and sometimes I get an agreement to be paid, but they don't send the check. So I have postcards. 
that I send. It just says Deuteronomy 24, 14, and 15, and I mail it off to them. And then they get their Bible out and they say, I wonder what he meant by that. What I meant by that is send the check. Fourth, Moses says, you shall not practice injustice toward the widow, the orphan, or the immigrant. This is the big, this is the big triad in biblical faith of the most vulnerable people in a patriarchal society, a widow without a husband, an orphan without a father, and an immigrant without rights to the land. So what we need to do is to make a longer list of who the vulnerable are now who are entitled to economic justice. And then Moses in Deuteronomy becomes much more specific and he says that when you harvest your wheat, you shall not go back into the field and pick up what you drop. You shall leave it for the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant. When you harvest your grapes for wine, you shall not go back and pick up what you missed. You shall leave it for the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go back and pick it up. You shall leave it for the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant. And then that law ends by saying, you shall remember that you were slaves in Egypt and you were brought out to freedom and justice. So this was before the laws of enclosure. You know about the laws of enclosure in the 18th century England? in which they fenced the estates of the landed so that the poor people could not come in and get wood that they needed to heat their homes. So this is a law against laws of against rules of enclosure so you have to leave the property open so that the guideline for the economy is not ownership the guideline for the economy is need. And the last rule that I will mention, uh, which is a, a little bit awkward, uh, but uh, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses says, if somebody has committed a huge crime, you may, you have, you have to remember, that the, the ancient society was a very brutal society. You shall not administer more than 40 lashes. That sounds very severe to me, but it was not nearly as severe as what they had been doing where they nearly beat people to death. And then Moses adds this very strange phrase, you shall not do more than 40 lashes in order that you will not humiliate the offender. So covenantal law cares about the dignity of the vulnerable offender, which sounds to me a lot like prison reform, which sounds to me like an act of compassion toward those who have violated the codes of society. Now there's more, but that's enough. And what I want to say to you then is that the, if, you, if you trace the development of Torah interpretation from the book of Exodus to the book of Deuteronomy to the prophets and then on into the rabbinic tradition in Judaism or on into the New Testament and the church fathers in Christianity, the, the critical reflection on the requirements of neighborliness have to keep being reformulated. And what I want to suggest to you is that we are uh, an ongoing part of that continuing dynamic process of developing the codes and the protocols that will make neighborliness possible. 
And I am glad that there are as many of us here tonight as there are, but what I think is that there are very few of us here tonight. And the reason there are very few of us here tonight is that our society and our political economy are organized against neighborliness. And therefore, what we are going to be thinking about are concrete steps that are inherently bold and that are inherently subversive of the dominant culture and its value system. So we're going to be invited by Peter to begin to be very specific, but as we get very specific, we will be continuing the work of the Torah tradition that believes that the only way to stay out of the reach of Pharaoh and be reduced to slaves is to be practicing generative neighborliness. So I am glad we're going to be at that process.